evening. Thank you so much for joining us again during this session about raising a child in America. And we are very, very fortunate tonight to be joined by two special guests. These are experts in their own areas, and they're going to share with you about their own experiences raising their children here in America. First, our presenter is Mr. Adil, and second is Mr. Ellie, and then our uh, entertainer tonight, who is providing this strong coffee, is Miss Wardenish, because some of you want a strong coffee. And when I said we we're going to have it this evening on Thursday, I meant it. So I'll let our presenters go around and introduce themselves. The format for this evening is they're going to give the introductions about themselves, and I'll ask the first questions um, about comparing the educational system or how they see raising a child in America versus their country of origin. And then you guys, this is your class. You are here to learn. Please come up with questions. These are experts. Utilize their skills. And I thank you so much for taking the time to be here this evening. Adil, you're first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Adil. Um, I'm originally from Iraq. Um, I was born in, um, in December 5th. I'm not going to tell you that I was born in 1964. Uh, but um, I have eight kids, and I arrived um, to the United States in um, September 22nd, 2008. So it's been over six years now. Uh, I work as a freelance Arabic interpreter uh, with variety or uh, different um, entities um, outside um, South Dakota right now. Thank you. My name is Eli Nitunga. I am from Burundi. I live here in Sioux Falls uh, starting February uh, 2008. I have uh, seven kids and wife. And uh, what I do here, I worked in a different company. I worked in a John Murray company. I worked to IV for now to help my kids get better. And then uh, I come from my country, passing in different country. I had uh, I, I had a I had a refugee from 2007 to two till 2000. Uh, sorry, uh, from starting uh, 1972 to 2007 in different country. I was refugee in Congo, in Tanzania, and even in my country too on that period. So today I'm here as living in the show house uh, with my family. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Miss Wadenish, our coffee maker for this evening. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Wadenish Jima. I'm from Ethiopia. So I came in for 97. I was still working with John Moore. I have two kids and a single mom. That's it. Thank you. And where do your kids go to school? Longfellow School. Longfellow Elementary. Thank you. Uh, first question for this evening is, would like our two presenters to um, compare and contrast the educational system in their home country versus United States. Uh, Adil is going to be able to give us his perspective regarding this question. Thank you. Well, um, as you may know, um, Iraq uh, is one of the most ancient um, civilizations. Um, even it was the most um, mentioned uh, nation in, in Bible even, and it was the second mentioned uh, nation. Um, it came under different um, 
uh, names, um, you know, land of Shinar, Mesopotamia, you know, Babylon. Um, so all these names uh, refer to Iraq. Well, and, and, and just like in the new Iraq, um, you know, um, country that it was established after the uh, British um, invasion in, in 1914, they established the first government um, in 1920. And they had established a very strong educational system and it was uh, built, um, you know, with the help of the British. And so it was very efficient and uh, sophisticated system. Um, till uh, 1979, we had the best um, educational system on the whole Middle East. We had people coming from all around the region to study or to get the medical attention in Iraq. As soon as Saddam decided to start uh, the war um, with Iran, or what, what we can call it, the first Gulf region, start sending teachers to, um, to the, um, what do you call it, the front um, edges of the war, and, and we will have now um, a lot of you know, casualties because of, of that war. Now we have our educational system start to collapse because of that war. Then as soon as he finished that war in 1988, he decided to invade Kuwait in 1990. And after that, um, you know, war, we have lost a lot of, you know, casualties, a lot of, you know, innocent people that they just like get killed in that war or being um, lost or, or never, you know, what do you call it? Um, they were just like nowhere, basically. Um, they, they don't have a record with the Red Cross. They don't have a record with any other um, international uh, entity or agency. Um, as soon as that war finished, we have the international embargo against Saddam to eliminate Saddam's abilities to build mass destruction weapons. And therefore, we have um, teachers start just like drop working for school trying to support their families. Um, the teacher might get only two, three dollars a month which is, you know, does not support his family at all. And um, therefore, we have our system is just like going down and down. But I've, I've, I've known a lot of teachers that they never lost faith in their ability to establish the, you know, the educational system again. They've been trying and trying but after 2003, they have something even worse than the war itself. They had corruption. And with the corruption, you know, you will have, you know, notice that there might be a lot of infrastructure needed here and there, and they're gonna tell you that, yes, we are planning to do that. And now we, after 11 years of that change, our students in Iraq still go in um, what do you call it um, schools that that um, that they were built from um, front palm fronts um, mud bricks and they sit in just like in cold weather. I have some pictures. I'm gonna just like show it to you guys. So um, with that being said. Um, just like trying to close your eyes and imagine a student come from this, you know, zone and come to the United States. And for myself, having, um, when we arrived here in the United States, I had um, seven kids. Um, the older ones were already skipped in school in Iraq and they refused to go to school in Syria because of, you know, they said, it's gonna be very similar to what we had in Iraq, so we are not going to schools in Syria. And when they reached here, and um, we convinced them to go to school, at least to give it a try for 30 days. You know, just like you have three days, your money back, you know, guarantee that if you don't like it, then drop school. They start school, and they start liking it because we don't have uh, overcrowded classes here. 
um, there are just like a few students in each uh, class. Um, teachers well um, skilled and they have a very good communication ability with non-English speakers students. Um, we had uh, great homeschool liaisons. Uh, we had Marta, we had Clara. She, she was visiting us often at home just like to make sure that kids are doing fine. Um, we, had, we had the ability to communicate with the school. I'm gonna tell you a joke. Oh, one day um, after the, the uh, in Iraq, that was in Iraq, um, the, the, the finals, and there's the finals for the elementary school as well. After the finals finished, um, the principal of one of the schools, and he was my friend, he came to my house and he said, what are you gonna give me if I tell you that your kids just passed the final? I said, okay, name it. And he said, okay, I need two bags of cigarettes. I said, okay, that's easy. So we went to the um, next door grocery store, we get the cigarettes, and he took it. Five minutes later, he had a fight with my brother. Next day, when we received the cards, it shows that my kids failed the whole classes just because they had a fight, nothing, nothing else. So with that, you know, with this um, kind of um, attitude at school, um, all the Iraqi students are struggling. Um, they are struggling because of many things, you know, um, lack of communication between school and and um, parents and and um, and um, the the student as well. Um, usually, uh, seeing the teacher outside is a scary thing because the teacher would not accept you to would not accept to see you on the street because that means you're sneaking out of the house without telling your parents. So now I had um, Muhammad, uh, my son. He's um, he's 24 years now. And he was the one that I most struggled with uh, when we first got here. Now um, he accepted to go to um, what I call it, job corps or job corps in, in Utah. Um, he graduated, he got his um, high school from there. Um, he learned a trade, um, he became an electrician, though he did not practice that. He started working for Walmart on the east side. And last night he was promoted to a lead. Um, so uh, I had Ahmed, he's a supervisor with Walmart as well in, in Sioux Center. Um, Asil is a supervisor with Lewis. Um, of course at home they are supervising me, but um, you know, I need a lot of s attention there. Um, also um, I had um, Ali that he's planning to go to STI. Um, I have Hadil, she's going to uh, Roosevelt High School. Um, Hadir uh, is going to George McGovern. Um, Hussein and Tabarak, they both go to Hayward. Tabarak is at the Bree School. Hussein is a third grader. They are doing awesome. Um, Hussein came to the country with, uh, with a, uh, a head injury and doctor anticipated that he will just like, he will not be able to learn. Now he speaks a good English. Sometimes he's even making fun of my accent. You know, dad may have an accent, which is, you know, fine because he will remember that he will need an accent, you know, in the long run. But <laughs> so uh, that's that's what what I meant with that, you know, that they get the chance to succeed here. They get the chance to start a new life here. Um, when we first, the first um, hours that we um, arrived into um, New York Airport, um, JFK, and I heard, you know, some rough comments, you know, from the, some of the um, IOM employees. Um, I decided just like never look to what they said. But with that, just like going to the officer, because I had seven children, and they thought that I cannot speak English or I cannot respond to them. But when it comes to the point that I need to respond, I responded. And I said, well, y you are representing um, an international agency, you should behave yourself. And the response I got it from him is, uh, 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 I, I, uh, uh, so uh, a lot of ops there. Uh, and and um, I, I thought to myself, you know, just like, what I have done. Now I am totally in a strange environment to my family. I can speak English, but my family cannot, and they cannot, you know, um, communicate. So it's a different culture. 
uh, it's a different um, environment, different language, different, different weather even. And uh, that, that was just like, it was a huge jump and it was a huge adjustment for all of us. Um, now, every day I've seen my kids, you know, succeed and just like they are, they are successful in their lives. Um, they have they have practiced you know um, all all means of um, respect. Though um, with the older kids, it was very easy to adopt the American culture because they have their own roots. That's they understand both cultures now in the Iraqi or the Arabic culture, and they they understand the American culture, so they are very you know respectful. The younger ones. They adopted totally, they adopted the American culture. We are trying just like to keep our own rules at home, just to keep the mother tongue. We, you know, they are not allowed to speak English at home, you know. And if someone trying just like to speak English, um, everybody is going to say it's just like Arabic, Arabic, no English. Because we want them just like to keep this kind of, you know, root. Uh, I, I don't want them just like to totally. Um, being out of roots, then we have to adopt the culture without having roots, and that's going to be tough because they might lose both cultures. And uh, you know, therefore, uh, the only the only person that I'm still struggling with is the teen, the 16. She was 13. Um, now she's 17. Because she's, she's in between two cultures, she's in transition. Um, she, she didn't adopt the whole um, Arabic culture. She's still not used totally to the American culture. Here's the point of struggle, because now she's trying to imitate whatever she's gonna see outside. Um, though she know that not whatever she see, she see outside or so outside is correct. Um, she criticized some of the acts then next hour she's gonna practice the same act. And of course that's very difficult and we just like keep trying to, um, trying to educate her and just like to keep her on, on the right track all the time and not to lose track here and there. Just like adopt both cultures and you're gonna be fine. Y you cannot take the whole Arabic culture and trying to ignore the American culture. But there are practices on the American culture that we don't accept it on the Arabic culture. So you have to balance that. I think she's learning more and more about that, and she's doing fine. But I still have some concerns. Eli, the air is yours now. Sorry, I took longer than my support. No, thank you. Um, I will just like distribute some of the pictures for for classes in Iraq. Um, you will see some classes overcrowded, um, some students on the floor trying to do their homeworks. Um, we are talking about a country with, um, I'm sorry, I lied again. Um, I'm, we are talking about country with a $175 billion uh, budget. We are talking about $500 for a teacher monthly um, salary and $20,000 um, a parliament member only just like a monthly salary. Just imagine the gap. So, uh, no, thank you so much, Alan. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, so, Jeff is going to share the website so you can have a better view of the photographs and what the classrooms look like in a Iraqi school system. Is that okay? Yeah. Or do you want to have a, a look at this? Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the system of teaching in my country. First of all, I want to tell uh, how is my country. My country is Burundi, is the one which is the smallest in the African continent which has almost 27,000 kilometers squares. So is it small? Education in, our, in, in my country, the first of all, the country was colonized by 
people who speak French. Uh, the program is in French. Instead of sometimes on the, their schedule, they teach a language, Kirundi a language, in order to keep their original language. So they do have a schedule for that. The problem in my country first, kids at school, they live at home, they work. Some of them work around two hours. They use two hours and a half from their home to go to school. So it's the same to go to school and to come back. Only in the city, in the capital, they, some of them go with the car by those who have a car. It does not mean our people who live in the city has a car, no. So that is a big problem. And then the schools, uh, on the level, there is kindergarten in the city only. The, the kindergarten is taught by, uh, for kids who have uh, three years in the city only because we do not have those uh, possibility to get uh, the budget to teach them or all the country. So after that, kids who learn from after kindergarten, they go primary school. After primary school, they go secondary school. In primary school, they use books uh, which are written in French and in Kirundi. All the program, the system is in French because uh, those uh, people who colonized uh, the, our, my country speak French. So for today, but for today, two years ago, uh, we started the program in primary school to teach English in order to know more language. So the big problem at school the program about school is the same as here. They, they learn English, they, they learn math, science, uh, economy, and so on. So civics, the program is look the same. But one problem is to get the tools. They don't have the books. That's a big problem. One school can use one books. The kids don't have uh, the possibility to get a books as we do have here. We do not have a computer at school. So even with those problem, I apologize and uh, I agree with our kids. They do their best to go to school because they know they will gain their future there. So about the, my country, kids who frequent the school in the college, some of them get a chance to go outside the country uh, due to the possibility of the government. The government send them outside, but uh, they don't have a chance to come here. I don't know why. I don't have the idea. So they would like to come. They wish to come to learn here, but they don't have that chance. So after that, what's the uh, essential uh, problem which uh, limit our school to be in advance? Our economy is lower. Is the lowest? Is it? The country, even if they get some support, they can't satisfy their ministry. So at school, they try to do their best to help them to go to hospital about health. And that about health, we do have not a lot of hospital. And that they are separately instead of in the city where you can see many hospitals. 
you can see on in uh, in the uh, uh, city in the city one school two school but in the big city it's a lot why the problem they don't have the possibility to build those school some of our kids don't go to school because they don't have those possibility. So, how would they do their parent? Some of kids, our kids, go to, uh, to take time to leave to a home and they to go to stay where the school are. Uh, in 10 years ago, uh, there is where they started to build some school everywhere. So that is an advantage for my country. What they need, they, they need the support. Where they can find that support? I don't know exactly. Maybe to someone who understands how is the country and the visit to see what is really, really in the reality. So here in the education, the difference, the big difference we do have here, in the, in the school here, they do have um, tools from starting kindergarten. They use everything they need. But in my country, some of them don't have those tools to show. Even his learning about uh, technology only is a theory. He don't have where he can demonstrate that. And then he will learn that he will get a chance to demonstrate with that theory when he go outside the country to learn when he finish or, or when he go to continue his university is where he will get a chance to use those tools. That's a big problem in the education. Uh, uh, simply here, they do have everything in the primary school. My kids use computer to at school. That is a good idea here. So the problem, which means my country can be developed if we, you do not have many people who go to school and to learn hard. Your country cannot go in advance because it's where they do research. Even there is no research for anything, your country will still on the same level. There's a, a major problem uh, the country do have. So, but uh, we wish, we don't know exactly what time and, and when uh, the country can raise in one moment, I don't know exactly. So, here in the USA, our kids who come in here, we do our best to teach them our original language. And that the question which come there is where they ask why we to learn this language and we are not there and we still live here. The answer for them is this. Yes, to learn your language is good because you come here at a certain period, but you found other people who come in here. You were helped by those people. They spoke Kirundi, they spoke Swahili, or other language, and they, you understand. So even in the future, you are here to help, to be ready to help, to help those people who will come here in the future to inform to orient and uh, to speak them in their own language and they understand and that they will feel okay. That's why you must learn that and they keep your culture. So about culture, in uh, my country, at school, the kids, they teach them how they, they can continue with their culture. You will see sometimes someone who can greet you with both hands that is not a mistake, it's our culture. If you see some of them do that. <coughs> so, 
here they are different culture because of different people from different country. So that is the best way to keep even I am from Burundi. I keep my culture. I teach my kids to speak Kirundi. And they, they are learning English. I wish tomorrow there will be example to accept to teach other kids too. To keep the culture is good because if we take time, you will see uh, people in clothing. We are clothing differently sometimes which some like, some don't. So it's good to keep the culture. That's why we, we insist a lot for that. So here in the USA, they do have everything because, yes, this program of Kairan's uh, program to not get uh, tools to school, maybe it was happen, I don't know, but today they are able to satisfy their kids at school. They go with car. Even me, I go to pick them with car. It's good, too. So maybe other country will be the same. It's because here they had uh, almost 100 years ago, they follow those activities. That's why they are in advance. Uh, that is in a brief I can tell about education. So, in, in, as a conclusion, education in my country need to be uh, helped by people who are able to do. We cannot be like American people in, uh, uh, in the progress uh, today. No, maybe in the future it can be as soon as they will get uh, those access for those people who will try to understand how it is the country to visit because today even we do not have a, if any country do have any relationship with those country who were developed they can't be in successful for their result thank you Thank you, Ellie. Do you have another point? Yes. Um, I forgot to mention that um, the education in Iraq is a free from day one at school till they graduate um, out of college. Um, it's totally free. Um, the books, uh, stationery, you know, all these um, needed to, to complete your, your classes are free from the government. Also, our health system is free as well. But as I mentioned earlier today, um, it's because of the international embargo and the wars that Saddam um, went through. We had a nutritional problem. We have, we have almost over 45% of the Iraqi population under the line of poverty. And that's not because um, Iraq um, is in lack of resources or money, but it's, again, because of corruption. That does not mean that during Saddam Hussein um, era there was or there were no corruption. No, it was even worse. But we still live on this corruption chain that comes from Saddam to whoever following. And we, they cannot uh, get rid of that. Again, uh, the educational system in Iraq is totally free. So probably that's what they are missing in, in Burundi, Ally. It's not free, right? I can say about the, the money which they pay at school, that is why uh, it's very difficult. Only those who are in kindergarten, there are some organization who help as a Catholic church and a Protestant church where they do have uh, some access to help those kids. So those who go to university or primary school, they pay money, and it's very hard. So to get success in the university is very hard. Even if you have a knowledge, you can miss the point or the help. If you miss the help, you cannot go continue your study. 
very hard. So. Thank you. These are our experts. Please take time to learn more from them. You have this opportunity to ask questions, and I hope this session is going to help you become better uh, representatives of this diverse population that we have or we see in Sioux Falls, and I hope it's going to create a more respectful, respectful, safe environment for all of us. And these two points that are made here, you know, you, where you see in Iraq, there was free education, but due to various other issues like corruption, caused a lot of uh, inequalities. Now we have a uh, lack of access or free access to education in Burundi. Again, at the huge problem, I get it comes to who, who is in power. Corruption, I think, is also key to all these inequalities. So I am not going to ask or make any more comments. I would like our participants to take this chance to ask questions. And I had sent an email to all of you to provide some questions before our session. Please take this moment to do it. And this segment is being videotaped. I'm so grateful to the Sioux Falls School District for providing these opportunities for those who are not able to be here this evening or who have been here in the past to take this opportunity to learn from us or from these two experts that we have here this, this evening. Um, if you have questions, please come forward or I can come over with the mic. And uh, Jeff is able to pick all the sounds properly. You may not hear properly, but Jeff is able to take and pick up the sounds very well. Is that correct, Jeff? OK. So do you want uh, the mic? Please, um, I'm going to pass around the mic. I will start with Gary. Well, you say that <clears throat> Iraq, um, the British, the British were in control in the early part of the 20th century, and the French, right? right. Now, do you, do you believe that they, they had a positive impact on education, for instance, at that time, or, or didn't, didn't they make any difference at all if, if they hadn't been there? hundred years before that. So Kimber with the, the Ottomans with the Brits, they have their own, you know, policy. They have though they were just like trying to follow their own agenda in Iraq, but they helped establish an educational system that was and still very respectful in the region. We have um, a well known doctors um, all over the world, just like the the best um, transplant, kidney transplant doctor is from Iraq. Um, the best cardiologist in London is from Iraq. Now, NASA just nominated one Iraqi scientist, uh, scientist to help build a station on Mars in 2023. So that give us a heads up, just like, you know, what kind of educational system we have. They start establishing the educational system in Iraq. That's true, the Brits did help with the school system in Iraq. But since they are after, the Iraqis took the responsibility to build their own system. And till today. So um, there, was, there was an additional buildup, but they started the first steps. That's, that's just like to fur uh, for me, this is fair to say they establish the first steps and the Iraqis continue the build up. The system of education in my country is in the government. When the colony come, they agree with them to follow those rule, and they did for today. The president who is in charge with the country for today, he is changing 
that in adding more language. So for today, they learn English starting in a fifth, uh, 30th grade or second grade. They start learning English. That's a big point for that. So even the president, the actual president today is trying to do his best to change some uh, position, some uh, rule, and to go through with the present uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you. Who is next? I'm going to pass the mic around. Julie? Do the female students in either one of the countries have the same schooling qualities as the male children do? And to that question, uh, sorry, Julie. To add to that question, I noticed in the pictures that the um, female students were separate from the male students. So I wonder if that has anything to do with that. Um, they start separating they, at some, um, um, some schools. They start separating females, you know, students um, after 2003. And that's due to a new uh, religious ideologies that they were brought after 2003. Otherwise, um, Schools were, um, you know, they were not separate till um, high school. Then after that, they separated, you know, kids. But at college, they are all together. Um, uh, just like at the end of the session, um, if you give me just like two minutes, I, I want to ask a question. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm not going to ask that question right now. <laughs> so, uh, Ali, uh, do, you, do you have a, an additional comment? What was the educational system? Was it equal? Was it accessible by both girls and boys? Oh, yes. Uh, both girls and the boys go to school on the same age. There is no difference. And the, there are those kids, the problem to start to school is not easy. I tell uh, on the primary school, they start, they start school at seven years. Those who, went, who did not go to kindergarten, even they did not wear help at church because the church they have uh, opportunity to help kids to learn uh, how reading and so on. So they start at seven years. Even if he did not go to kindergarten, he must start school at seven years, either girls and the boys. That's the same thing in Iraq. Thank you. You, you notice that we're using uh, elementary, primary, uh, same thing, uh, secondary, and here we use the term high school. So we mean the same thing. And that's due to the British language. Yes. You know, English. Thank you. So Melissa, you have a question? No. Um, anybody? Richard and Jack, do you guys have a question? Okay. I, I'm interested uh, in uh, maintaining with your children, maintaining the culture and their heritage, because it's very important that they know where they came from and, and be very proud of their home countries. How does that relate with their interaction with the children that they have, like your daughter in third grade, which obviously I must meet her every day, but I'm just curious as well, Ollie, your children, how do they, how, <clears throat> what's the interrelationship with their peers in the school system? Yeah, well, at the school system as well. a very good relationships with their beers at school. Um, they have friendships, um, you know, just like they, they have, you know, um, they know their, their beers um, birthdays, you know, they are trying to interact on these activities. Um, though, again, they're trying to adapt whatever they're gonna see. 
and that's going to be you know hard for us because it's yes okay. because you know just like we keep we trying just like to keep educating um teaching mm -hmm. and just like to maintain the culture that we came from um on my and my citizenship ceremony um and that was back on um, december 2013 i decided to wear my traditional arabic you know clothes and i went there wearing the the, the I don't call it the, the a gal and you know just like wearing clothes. So um, the bailiff at the um, the federal court and just like was looking to me like that. I said, okay, this is not an Arabic Batman, but just like I'm here for my ceremony. So uh, you know, just like th the the message I wanted to relate to my kids that even if I became a U.S. citizen, I'm here in the United States. I'm trying to keep my own culture. I want to respect my own culture, and I want you to do so. And this is this is my message to my family, you know, just like generation, they're gonna remember that. Mm -hmm. So they are doing well at school. They, um, I never, I never had an incident of being called to school because kind of a conflict at school. Um, you know, uh, their beers at school, trying to learn more about the culture, why they are wearing those clothes, why they are wearing the hijab or the. Uh, scarves, why they are, you know, just like wearing those long clothes. They're trying to learn and also trying to keep the same um, healthy relationship without being uh, being bridgeless. And we have not um, noticed that in, in the school for the last um, six years that we lived here. We have not noticed a, um, a one single incident show bridgeless at school, and and really, th this is a very healthy thing to have. Uh, what I can say in the education, a relationship with our kids and the kids they found here, is very good. So they keep working together, even there is an uh, any type of uh, things they do. We can know exactly because we work in a collaboration with teachers. We do the conference at school to know exactly what's going on at school with our kids and the teachers. We work in the one, we start one step and they keep going. So our kids work together with other kids even they don't speak them the same language, but only the one language share is English at school. It is why they not speak English better than us. So that's the big things we admire. We admire. So after that, we can't stop to show them our culture, how to put their clothes on, how to go to participate in the community, to visit others to go to church or to go shopping everywhere. We teach them how to go. And because it's very interesting for them, for us everywhere, because when you meet someone you don't know, you know exactly how to greet him in one way. And for education, for parents, even if our kids follow that, it will be the best because if you mix with an, an individual who is a parent, he can say, excuse me, and say, excuse me, that's a good thing for our parent. But for kids, I see not yet because the parents know what to do. Our kids, I think they will learn from parents. That is why we keep going with our traditional culture and the not to forget, they must mind knowledge why the person is working in that way. And he can't imitate because he don't know why he's working in that way. So there is a good collaboration between uh, for us parents and the school. Thanks. Um, by the way, we, we met myself and Ali several times, but we were just like passing each other probably here and there. But tonight when I get into the room, uh, Ali greet me in Arabic. 
and I greet him in Swahili. <laughs> so uh, we forget about English for a minute there. So <laughs> Thank you. And this might not be a question, but <clears throat> my grandparents were immigrants, came to America back in the 1800s. And you talk about traditions where you want to, at home, you want to keep the language. So do you think 10 years from now that your children will still want to keep that tradition of what they were born? If they were born German or Russian or Arabic or what it might be, you think being translate coming to America, you think that they all want to keep that tradition? That they want to just, or will they want to kind of fall back to what you were when you were younger? Are you trying to embed into them that we're here? We want to learn what we can hear and start a new tradition by learning all the American things? Well, this is kind of very... Thank you for that nice comment. And um, you, when I go I'm, with I'm that... Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, here's the thing, you know. Where we come from and where we are right now, we can combine both. You cannot separate, because if you separate, you're going to fail. Because you're always going to look into your roots, and you're not be able to go and just like to walk into the future. Because you will say just like, I'm from the Arab world. You know, I cannot do this. I cannot do that. But if you combine and you're trying to adapt slowly into the community where you live, that's the, going to be the key. Because that way, you will have both culture mixed slowly. If you do it just like, you cannot take a pizza out of the oven and put it on a freezer. It, yeah, you cannot eat it later on. You know? But if you just like do it gradually, you're going to eat it while it's hot. You're going to leave whatever leftover in, in the fridge. You're gonna, this is kind of an example. But you, if you do it slowly, then you will have that um, combination in, in the future. An ad is this. Uh, for instance, if you want to uh, get an answer for something, you must ask a question, where is it coming from first? You must know the origin of the things to know the answer. So after knowing the origin, you will be able to get an answer. The answer in the future, it will come as something which will continue in the presence without taking this way or that way. It will show exactly which way they follow. So for today, we do teach them our culture because they are smaller. Mm -hmm. They don't know about where they are. They must learn from us. In the future, they will ask, where was your country? How was your country? how people lived the day. And the those who do research, they must follow the, the history of the country. They cannot do nothing without knowing the history. If you know history, you know the, the thing the country needs. And you will be in the progress one uh, step by step. Thanks. That's a great comment. Um, with my work, working for the school district, and. Uh, assisting various parents um, and collaborating with various teachers, we um, remind each other to make sure that we respect the cultural heritage from which all of our students come from. Especially, we encourage the parents to read to their children at home in their native language. Because if they have a strong background or historical background, they will be able to have a strong language um, skills or even a strong historical background. They're likely to respect themselves and respect other people. 
that is just a fact. And right now, we are almost coming to cl a close to our session. Um, Adil, you had, you wanted to make yeah, a uh, comment or a point? Um, you know, um, a comment, it's, it's regarding the whole, you know, just like educational system in, in my country. Now we have seen, um, you know, the, the pictures and, and the overcrowded classes and with um, over 45% of people living under line of poverty, you know, we will see students drop off school to help and assist their families. And that way we will have more illiterate people on the streets that they're going to be victims of extremists from all religion, you know, all kind of religions, to brainwash them and send them to do stupid things. And that's, that's, that happened in, in, in Burundi, I believe, in, with the Hotso, um, you know, Totsi and, you know, just like those uh, tribes, and they start killing each other, the, the two famous tribes. And it happened every day in my country. You know, just like people being um, recruited just like to kill each other. That's because of lack of education. And if you look into the Iraq back on, I would say not far from now, it's just like 1979, bef right before Saddam taking over or do his coup. Um, Iraq was the number one country on Middle East in all levels, industrial, educational, health, health system, everything. You know, Iraqis were able to go to Europe to spend some money during summertime because they have their own life and they want to enjoy every minute. Now, with the wars, with the, with, with the corruption, with, with lack of educational um, you know, resources, I would say, we see and notice every day that we have people get killed because of lack of education. I'm sorry if I made that comment, but this is, this is the truth. Um, it, it's very painful uh, for me to say that about my country, but this is the truth. Um, we cannot just close our eyes and just like, I wish that wouldn't happen in my country. It need, it need a lot of work. Um, for myself, I, I had a lot of um, friends that they are working on the educational field I would say I have faith on their ability to change, you know, the mentality of the, you know, the, the superiors even. So hopefully we're going to see some change in the few years. But let's pray that we will not have a lot of people get killed because of lack of education. Thank you. Yes, so we're going to give you a chance to make a closing statement, right? Okay. Yeah. What I can say as a conclusion, the education, you cannot educate someone who is not healthy. The education go with healthy. So in my country, the president, the actual president, took time to, to put the in the government, the rule, those uh, wi female uh, women who will get a baby in the future to treat them for nothing is free. They can go to get that. So that is uh, another point. Uh, in one way, he's changing the education. And the, those who will learn in the future, they will know exactly what past and uh, some of, uh, they do have a, a card a ca a family card which will help uh, those kids to go to hospital uh, due to their parent so uh, in brief is is going to be in the future i wish there will be a, a chance to change and uh, to get better and better Today, is, uh, the education is keep going, but we do not have too much school. But the parents are doing their best to build their own school. And the, the government take 
uh, take step two to help them to give the place where they can build, that's a good idea too. Thank you. Thank you. Adil, do you have any more closing comments? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, um, class, it was a pleasure um, being part of this session, and we want to thank these two guests or experts in their cultural uh, field for coming and sharing their personal perspective. I want to remind you that this is not always easy to share our stories. So when I, I have Adil or Ellie to come and share their story, I'm always humbled and I respect that. And to make, I understand it's not easy, as you know, to talk about painful stories, the background. It's not something you can just drop and start retelling the, like it was eating a piece of cake. So these two gentlemen have had like a hundred years worth of uh, life experiences, although they're not a hundred years old, but um, they teach me to be humble and to be a better server of future parents that we are continually seeing and serving in the Sioux Falls School District. So thank you so much for giving your time this evening. And thanks to everybody. <laughs>